Thank you, first of all, to the National Health Conference for inviting me. Uh, delighted to be speaking, and I'm so delighted to see so many fantastic, enthusiastic trainees wanting to become doctors and, and for this talk, entering the wonderful field of surgery. So I, I do wish you all the very best, and I hope that this talk gives you just a broad overview of what you've got ahead of you. And also, I want to impress on every single one of you, all of this is possible. It can seem so daunting when you hear talks like this, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of really great talks about just how much there is to do. But having said all of that, there's so much information and there's so much support, and I've left some of my contact details here and I'll leave them on the last slide as well. So please, please, ha although there is so much work to do and there's so much preparation to do, having said all of that, there are so many people like these wonderful people who are speaking at the conference, myself, anyone who are here to support you. And I want to start with that by saying all of this is fully possible. And I want to spend just a few minutes talking very briefly about myself, where I come from and how I've ended up here. And to anyone who wants a degree of inspiration, surgery is just such a fantastic specialty to get into. I've never, ever looked back and I really, truly love what I do. Yes, of course, it is hard work and it doesn't come without sacrifice. But if I could have said anything to myself back when I was in your position, all of this is worth it and i've i've never regretted a single day that i've been a surgeon and had the privilege of calling myself a surgeon um i i started off in life in uh birmingham which is where i grew up and unfortunately uh due to unfortunate personal circumstances i grew up homeless for a period of time and uh, during that time there was certainly no inclination there was certainly no idea of there being prospects um education seemed like a luxury um, and it certainly didn't seem like someone like me in the background that I came from, that anything like higher education, university, let alone something like medical school, uh, would be possible. Having said all that, it is all possible. And I was very lucky to have opportunities to become educated. I uh, worked very hard, as all of you, I'm sure, are no strangers to. And I had opportunities to become educated. I then got into medical school. And I suppose my inspiration for surgery came um, when I uh, went into oral and maxillofacial surgery. So I was in my final year and I, I was at that phase where I was trying to decide what kind of career I might want. And everything that you do within medicine, try and do early. And I'll be going on and on and on about this throughout my talk about preparation, preparation, preparation. And I saw a seven-year-old girl who was orphaned in a car accident in America. She lost her parents and her only other surviving family was an uncle who was based here in London. So she flew from America and that's when I saw her in clinic and she was having facial reconstructive surgery done. And I fell in love with her story and the, the finesse that was done in reconstructing the injuries that she had. She as a patient was absolutely incredible. Um, and the people that I saw working on her were also incredible. Uh, these incredible surgeons, uh, registrars, doctors, nurses, uh, speech therapists, all, all this amazing team coming together to transform this person. And that's where my inspiration came from in surgery. And that's what I do now as a maxillofacial surgery registrar. So for all of you who are embarking on this journey, I promise you it is well worth it. Uh, it is a fantastic specialty to be in, in terms of surgery and what surgery can offer you uh, is absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm very lucky to be able to say that my career has taken me from literally the, the streets of Birmingham. And I've now spoken at the White House, uh, the House of Commons at the United Nations. And that is just a, a taste and a glimpse of what is achievable. I've been able to travel the world and go to places I never thought I'd be able to go to. Uh, much of that has been funded, uh, all because of this career that we're all following and pursuing. Now, having said all of that, core surgical training, the entire point, and I think it's really important to understand the spirit of what core surgical training is. And as you're going to hear me again and again and again, this is about preparation. So do not be under any illusion to everyone who is listening. And I'm saying this to you because I want all of you to be inspired, not to be afraid. I want all of you to be motivated and not to be put away. 
but you must understand your competition and you must understand that there are the caliber of people who are going into core surgical training much of what i'm going to speak about and the advice i want to give to you not only will they already know that they will have actioned all of that and really they're using core surgical training as a platform to start their st3 preparation and in a sense that's what core surgical training is the entire idea is to give you a flavor of surgery of the kind of surgery that you might want to enjoy to start preparing you and prepping you with the skills of making more senior decisions because the whole point is actually to get you onto a registrar training pathway and to get you a national training number so that whatever surgical specialty you decide to go down, uh, you're prepared for that. So jumping into the process itself, something I didn't understand and I only fully, fully became aware of really after foundation training is that you apply to a deanery uh, within the UK and in that deanery, or a set number of hospitals that you will rotate around and within those hospitals are your surgical specialties and they do try and make them sensible sort of things so for example i wanted to do oral and maxillofacial surgery so i applied to a themed rotation which even if it didn't have max facts in it it had allied specialties like plastics and ent for many of you if you want to go into general surgery uh, you really need to try and gain 12 months of general surgical experiences. And so the point is to start looking early, look at the areas that you want to be in. And for me, geography wasn't a problem. I was ranked number one in core surgical training and I went to Scotland, um, even though I was London based and I went to a London medical school and I did London foundation training and I had a, a fantastic time. So my advice to you is, of course, some of you that will be completely different. For whatever reasons you'll be strongly wanting to stay in a particular geographical area whereas for others you're absolutely desperate to do a certain rotation so look ahead and be fully aware of preferencing and knowing what rotation program you want to apply for or if it's geography then uh, rank highly the, the geographical location that you want to be in now i am all of this information is available i will send more information summarized in slides uh, and I do believe that these talks are being recorded. Uh, but every single year, there are always uh, people who don't get past this first hurdle. So if there are international uh, colleagues who are applying, you must check the essential criteria and just be sure that you're able to pass this particular phase. Core surgical training offers all uh, applicants a guaranteed interview as long as they have the essential criteria. And um, for UK trainees, this will be very, very obvious and things that you don't really have to think about. Uh, things like uh, language, fitness of practice, that you've completed your foundation training. Something that is very important is career progression. At core surgical training is a competitive process and you are penalized if you've done more than 18 months of experience after FY2. And the idea is that someone who's been through core surgical training applications two, three, four times, will start to number one, build up an unfair advantage because they'll have both been through the process several times compared to someone who's applying for the first time. And I suppose the other reason for having this career progression barrier in which you're penalized is after a certain period of time, you start to develop surgical skills and you start to develop bad habits that make it very difficult to start training you. Um, and, and whether that's fair or not, unfortunately just one of the things that we have to accept so please be aware of that it this as far as i know and understand does this doesn't hard stop stop you from applying uh, but you certainly are penalized uh, for having more experience now this is where we want to focus on these are the desirable criteria, and this is why there are three uh, stations based around core surgical training the clinical the management and the portfolio and in a way your applicant guides again i'll send you all of these I'll send again a summary of everything that I'm speaking about. This is why we have those three stations and you can see clearly where the marks are going to come from in terms of they will test your clinical skills and that comes have, having spent time on the wards and then having practiced interview stations and questions and I will be giving you uh, practice interview stations and some practice answers uh, within this talk. Research and audit is so, so important. Sorry, I'm so sorry, your, your screen froze. Um, I believe it's still on the first slide of the presentation. Oh, is it? Uh, I yeah. have moved forward. Uh, is that any better? 
No. Maybe try unshare screen yeah, again. No problem. Oh. No problem okay. I'm back to me and I'm just gonna try sharing again. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, now yeah. it's different. Perfect. Perfect. So as I was mentioning, desirable criteria clinical skills and research and audio and this is really important and I'm going to expand on hopefully all of you will have started this because doing research takes time and completing audits take time and again be under no illusion there will be plenty of candidates who have already published and they have that part of their portfolio ready um, and I want to try and help maximize your points so don't just do an audit for the sake of doing an audit you know you have to complete the loops and you have to present and the more and more that you do this, the easier it will become because a lot of these domains are horizontal. So doing a presentation of your audit will then automatically give you marks in the presentation section. And presenting your research paper uh, as a poster or an oral presentation, again, gives you marks in presentation. And you'll be so used to doing this by the time you get down to your interview that it'll be very simple and very straightforward. Uh, teaching has become an even greater part of this process. And we're going to speak very briefly about getting involved in teaching, making sure that you're giving formal teaching as opposed to informal. And personal skills and commitment, again, come as part of your training, and we're going to speak about those. So this is what is so, so important. When it comes down to it, what is the actual uh, process? So once you've logged into Oriel, which in the UK, that is the application management system, you will fill out a very simple, and very straightforward application window that asks details such as uh, your uh, training background. So what are the posts that you've done since leaving medical school? What experiences have you had? Uh, uploading your CV and it's very simple and very straightforward. When you get to the actual interview at the moment and COVID may change some of this and we already know that it will be online based. You have three main stations, 60, uh, sorry, uh, they're, they're split equally with 33% across the three stations. So a management, a portfolio, and a clinical scenario. In terms of the clinical scenario, you'll be given two scenario-based questions. And for one of them, you'll have preparation time. And the second one, you'll just be asked within your uh, scenario station. And I'll tell you how I prepared for that. Uh, with your management station, again, you'll have a pre-prepared uh, presentation to give. You'll have two minutes of questioning and then you'll be asked another management scenario within the station itself. And then for, finally, the portfolio station, which again is very, very important, but everyone please be aware, it is so easy to spend all of your time printing pages and pages for your portfolio. As long, and as long as it's important and it's relevant, that needs to be done, but that is all very time consuming and you must weight your preparation equally across three stations. Um, it's very, very easy, and I've seen every single year too many really excellent candidates give too much of their time uh, to preparing their portfolios. And all they do, although they do really well, they have to also not have any chinks in their armor when it comes to clinical and management. So here are my pearls, and this is what has always held me in great stead when I was applying for foundation training, when I was applying for course surgical training. Um, and also when I was applying for my registrar training, and I've been really lucky uh, to have ranked first in all three of those processes. So there's an age old adage that says, publish or perish. And that's not strictly true, but research does take a significant period of time to write a paper, to submit that, to await whether it gets accepted or not. And all of that takes time and it's not enough Hello, sorry, sorry, Mr. sorry um, Mr. Dub. So your um, screen is frozen again. Um, can we? Are you are you um, sharing the whole of your slide? Are you playing it on full screen? Yeah, it's on full screen. Oh, okay. Um, so I don't think it's moving forward. I think the problem perhaps is because um, if there's a problem with um, sharing the slideshow. Is it okay if you don't share it on full screen, but um, you can just move the slides? In? You. Of course. Uh, so can you still see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Can you try and move it to the next slide and see if it's working? How yeah. Is that, is that yeah, so it's working now. I think there was a problem with moving the slides before. But yeah, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, no, 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 no,
No problem at all. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, as I was mentioning about research. Now, this is really important. Whether you publish a nature paper, which take two years um, from doing your research to writing, to publishing, to working on the comments, you get the same credit and marks as doing a case report, which took two weeks to write, uh, submit, and then eventually get published. So, and that is not fair. That is not how research should work. Uh, but that is the game that you have to play and that is the application process so there is no reason why all of you if you haven't got any research now can't have at least one published paper and so here are my pearls for getting publications things like case reports often every single consultant has at least one patient that they thought was interesting uh, that they've not had a chance to write up and they want a keen uh, trainee doctor uh, student to be able to convert this into writing it as a case report. So case reports are very, very uh, quick, they're useful, um, and as long as you apply them to the right place, then they're a great way to have a first authorship on your CV. Um, and I suppose that's the other thing, you get marks based on whether you're just a contributor to your research paper, be it a case report or be it original research, to being joint first author or first author so try as much as you can to be first author because that is how you maximize your marks um, and also not not a trick but uh, something that i've often done with my project is often there's always vying for who's done the most amount of work and there's nothing wrong with joint uh, with um, sharing joint first authorship uh, that way you as authors get the same number of credit the same marks you can put your name first on your cv and on your applications and it counts exactly the same. Something else that is peer reviewed and counts in terms of publications are BMJ rapid responses. So if you go to the BMJ website and you read an interesting paper, original research or case report, and you draft a reply such as a letter, um, that is peer reviewed, it's published and it counts as an original publication. It will not get as many marks as original research and case reports because they're, they're deemed to be higher, but it still does count and they're very, very quick to do. Um, so those are some things to be aware of. Uh, briefly, and I'll speak more about these, are uh, prizes, uh, getting med school prize, prizes counts, your extracurricular prizes, as long as they've been awarded by a body like your medical school, also count and they're important. And then your audits, teaching, and commitment to surgery. And I'll go on to speak more about those. So with research, uh, and also uh, guys, I'm slightly flying through some of these slides because I really do want to open uh, to questions. I'm sure you all have questions and I want to try and get through as many of those as possible. Uh, so with research, it must be peer reviewed and it must appear on PubMed. If it doesn't, please don't waste your money or your time applying to non-peer reviewed, non-PubMed journals. Uh, your consultants and your registrars will guide you as to where to apply when it comes to applying for papers. Uh, and often it tends to be those journals that do not charge you a fee. So please don't get roped into uh, paying 150 pounds to publish your paper, which then doesn't even count, even if it is a great paper. The application committee will accept in press accepted and as I mentioned, first author, joint first author, and co-authorship. So in press means that your journal has accepted your paper and within a week or two weeks or a few months, they will eventually publish it, but they've given you a commitment that they've accepted your journal, uh, sorry, your paper. Accepted, of course, uh, it means the exact same thing. Um, and the things that get you marks are being a first author, a joint first author, or a co-author. And so submitted articles, uh, do not count for anything. So I'm sure that many of you will have excellent articles and you're, you're going through that frustrating process of awaiting your articles to be reviewed, but you cannot submit them and you will not get any marks. And please, please, again, don't put them in your portfolio because uh, number one, putting in filler like that to expand your portfolio is very, very transparent. It's very easy to see and it will not be looked on uh, well by the markers. Presentations, and this includes not just your research presentations, but also your audit presentations. Uh, and I will go on to speak more about this, but your local presentation. So this is in your department, in your hospital, 
the local education meeting or the morbidities and mortality meeting counts as a local meeting that you can present your work, be it audit, uh, be it research presentation, uh, or be it even a case report. Within your hospital, your hospital will be part of a deanery, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. And regionally, all the hospitals will get together to give an educational meeting and multiple consultants, multiple teams will come together. And that is where you can, again, offer to present your work. And that counts as a regional presentation. And then finally, as part of uh, conferences, many of these are held nationally and internationally. Uh, and that is where the process becomes competitive in which you submit your work. It is then reviewed and either it's rejected or accepted for a poster or oral presentation. And the reason for telling you that is that there is absolutely no reason why every single person who's listening should not be getting a local and regional presentation at the very least, because all that needs is an email to the organizer to say that you've got some work that you'd like to present. And it's very quick and it's very easy because usually these meetings are held at least every single month. Uh, in my own department, we have a local meeting every week. So uh, if, you're, if you're running short and you need to present something, then that's a great opportunity and a great way to get presentations through. Having said all that, I want every single one of you to be aiming for national and international presentations. Teaching has become a really big part and an important part of core surgical training. And there are two ways to think about this. There is the teaching and training that you yourself are developing as a teacher in your own right. So that is attending courses like Teach the Teacher and Train the Trainer. Uh, and these are uh, on the way to becoming formal um, qualifications, such as a PG Cert and a Master's in Education, that make yourself a good teacher and qualifies you to provide more formal based teaching. So these are outlined in the applicant's handbook. Uh, and after this talk as well, I will post more information about some of the courses that you can do. So at the very least, uh, this means you applying and trying to attend a course or even undertaking something like a master's or a PG cert. Now, uh, as I mentioned, I didn't do uh, any of those things other than the courses. So I hadn't done a PG cert or a master's. Um, and I stood, still did really well. So it, it's not to say that if you haven't done those things that you're not going to do well, but these are the things to think about and also that are available. The second part of teaching is the teaching that you deliver. And the two ways to think about this is that there is informal teaching and then there is formal based teaching. So informal teaching is taking a group of medical students, taking them up to the ward, and doing some bedside teaching. And that is fantastic and it's important and it's great, but it does count as slightly less in terms of informal based teaching. Formal based teaching is really easy to get. And again, it's along the same lines as of you applying to your local, your regional and national uh, meetings of your deaneries and your hospitals and giving a structured presentation that appears on a timetable. So it's really, really easy to actually demonstrate you've given formal teaching because all you need is a copy of that timetable that shows that you're the speaker and you're giving a particular topic. So uh, there are two things to that. One, if you don't have that, get a reference uh, from your consultant or someone who was present at the teaching, print that and include that in the teaching part of your portfolio that demonstrates and validates that you did this teaching. And the other thing is, whenever you do deliver teaching, try and ensure that there's a timetable that says where the meeting was, what the meeting uh, theme was, and clearly written your name and the presentation that you're giving. And that all counts and gives you maximal marks when you're getting into the teaching part of your portfolio. Right, let's speak about some uh, stations. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a clinical, a management and a portfolio station. So a very typical uh, station you might get, and this might be uh, the station that you're given beforehand that you get to think about and prepare, or it could very well be the station that you're given uh, as part of the last five minutes where you're, you're on the spot, you're given this uh, scenario and you have to think about what you want to do. So an example would be a 60 year old, 62 year old female uh, who's got lower back pain. It's acute set, uh, started 12 hours ago. It's gnawing in nature. She suffers from hypertension uh, and she admits to having moderate social alcohol intake. And the way to think about this is as a medical student, I thought about 
applying to foundation training. So I want you to think like an FY2, someone's got at least one year's experience and is starting to already think along the lines of a uh, more experienced doctor and about being safe. When you apply to your core surgical training, don't think about an experienced FY2, start thinking about what if you are the ST3 and the decisions that you need to be making and what you need to be thinking about. So based on this scenario, what do you think is the diagnosis? Is this someone that you, as a core surgical training, is going to review, do some bloods and then send home? So are you being safe? Or do you need to start thinking about some of the differential diagnoses that this patient may have, such as a hemorrhage or appendicitis or renal colic, all of these things, and of course, many, many more uh, differential diagnoses. What are you going to do as the core surgical trainee in order to investigate the most probable and the most likely of these diagnoses? Again, being broad so that you're not missing things, but again, that are going to answer very specific questions to safety your patient. Having done your investigations and in the interim, what management plans are you going to put in place to start either treating your patient or at least making them comfortable and to get them out of pain? And these are all very, very reasonable things that probably all of you are doing on a daily basis, but not thinking about in a formal manner and you only have a very set specific time. So for your clinical station, with all of these scenarios, I, I happen to use flashcards, but in whatever manner you want to do it, whether you're practicing someone, you need to think about being very, very structured and very, very specific. The, uh, the interview, uh, in interview panelists will have a marking sheet in front of them, but they also form an impression of you. So they will say, yes, has mentioned appendicitis. Yes, has mentioned about sending off bloods, about doing a chest radiograph. You get points for all of those, but also the way that you present all of these answers is also marked. And then where you go from your scenarios, your management can, can be really varied. So although you may start off talking about appendicitis, you may be guided along a different scenario. And although they have set questions, it's very easy for um, a panelist to say, right, you've thought about all of these things. What about if this is a GI hemorrhage? Can you tell me about uh, the signs that you look for? And you really were starting to talk about heart rate, tachycardia, hypotension, and what things that you would do to try and decide what level of shock your patient might be and the furthering things that you need to start thinking about. The management station is often very, very poorly prepared for because in a way, candidates don't really understand what the management station is about. And this absolutely does not mean clinical management. Clinical management is all in the clinical station. Management station very much relies on information and clinical governance. So that includes things like patient safety, information technology, um, whether sharing on a social media site is appropriate, uh, what happens when you have a clinical incident and what is the process, whether that's you dealing with a clinical incident or whether someone has uh, lodged a complaint against you and the process you have to go through. So a very common uh, question is about the WHO surgical checklist. Now, many of you, if you're uh, interested in surgery, will have been uh, within theatres in the theatre environment. And we do this not just every single day, but we do it multiple times a day. And you need to be comfortable knowing all of the different parts of the WHO surgical safety checklist and being able to speak about them. For example, the level of detail that you would be expected to know and to get marks for is checking that the correct site has been marked that there's a visible arrow and that this is on the consent form, whether it's left, right or not applicable. Checking whether the patient has an allergy and whether this has been highlighted to the surgical team. And also more recently, checking things like any loose um, caps, crowns, dentures, all pointed towards ensuring that the patient has a safe procedure with you. And this is an example of the clinical incident reporting form. Um, and again, many of you will have heard the term, you, you know, there's a DATEX that's being submitted or a clinical incident report. But do you actually understand and appreciate what that involves uh, and the various stages that, that goes through? Last but not least is, of course, the uh, portfolio. Now, uh, here is a brief overview and an example 
of uh, the breadth of things that are marked within your portfolio and in in general what the marks are for different parts of this now i do stress that this changes year on year or every other year and i'm just putting this up uh, as an example so um again what's very very easy to do uh, is lots of people focus uh, to get lots of presentations uh, and publications but they will ignore things like leadership and commitment to surgery and after a set period of time whether you have a thousand publications or three publications you there's a maximum number of marks that you can score uh, and so in this example there's eight so having zero marks for commitment or clinical experience not investing in a good portfolio that is presented well that makes it easy for your panelists to get to the sections that they need to you are losing very very easy marks and that's one of the big pearls that i want to be able to pass on to every single person who's listening please look at yourself in an overview manner so you will know that your strengths might be for example that you've given lots and lots of teaching and you've completed lots of cycles of your audit but if you know that you've not done anything at all in terms of leadership uh, that you've not done anything at all into demonstrating your commitment to surgery through courses you need to attend to that because you will then go on to lose easy marks and you can't get any more marks for the things that you all, uh, you have obvious strengths in. Uh, the, you know, all of these um, marks are given within your applicant handbook. So there's no reason whatsoever to not know exactly what to include. So this is a, an example of the commitment to surgery. You can score a maximum of eight marks and it'll be things like your surgical elective. So include a single page summary of what your surgical elective was where it took place, what you did, and what your outcomes were from your surgical elective. Simply being part of a, mem a, a surgical society will get you a mark. Doing an audit, but doing that based within surgery, and so on and so on. And so it's really, really easy to pick up these marks, but you have to be specific. And one thing please don't do, because as someone who sat on panels before, it's really easy to see that you're simply trying to add filler to your portfolio. And if you're missing a section, or for example, you just don't happen to have any publications, then so be it. You can answer um, a question based on that rather than trying to fill in parts of your portfolio and make it something that it's not. I'm sure I don't need to stress, but it's important to say never, ever lie on your portfolio, ever, ever, ever. In fact, don't lie on any part of your application ever. These things are checked. They are validated. And the consequences are much more beyond you just not getting a core surgical training place. And I've no doubt that no one would go down that pathway, but I think it's important to say. Uh, audits and quality improvement projects. It's really important, and I still meet really wonderful candidates who don't understand the difference between research and audit. With research, often you're answering a question, like, for example, does having a beard compared to someone who has no facial hair, does that predispose you to having uh, COVID infection. That is a particular question that you can go and do a study for, uh, publish uh, and then share your findings. Whereas an audit project, the, the question is already present. So you may want to know in all of the chest radiographs that are undertaken in a hospital, how many of those have the patient's details, the correct details labeled. Now there is a particular standard and guideline that says in the UK, all chest radiographs, abdominal radiographs, must have the patient's correct details. So there's a standard already for that. You then decide, well, if that's a standard and that's the guideline, then 100% of all of the chest radiographs that are done in my hospital should have the correct patient details. You then go and data collect and you compare in, say, a three-month or two-month period how many of those chest radiographs actually do have the correct patient details. And then finally, you present that, and that is your first loop cycle. Please, 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 if you're doing an audit, it should be with the aim of closing the loop. And once you have demonstrated, if, for example, it's 90% in your hospital, execute a plan, such as putting up the guideline, putting up the standards, uh, actioning the things that stop a correct patient details being put on the radiograph, and then re-audit that in three months. And that is the way to do a closed loop audit. And the question that you will get in your interview panel is what did you achieve with your audit? Did you actually make uh, patient safety better with your audit? Was anything learned? Was money saved by you doing your audit? So do not do an audit for the sake of doing it and not be able to answer that question. 
And obviously you get more marks if you have organized and delivered the audit yourself, as opposed to just being a contributor and being part of it. And that's a theme that runs throughout the uh, interview itself. Uh, very quickly, just uh, an example of presentations. Again, it's really clear and it's really open that if you've done a poster and presented that at a national and international meeting, you will get more marks than if you've gone to your local uh, hospital meeting and presented it. But you'll still get marks and that's important. I just want to end, um, there are lots and lots of resources. I happen to be publishing a book in core surgical training. Uh, and if you find that useful, by all means, uh, invest. And it has many, many more examples of some of the things I've spoken about. More importantly, whether you invest in that particular resource, whether you take part in uh, days like today, you know, I am here to help and lots and lots of other speakers are all here to support you. I have been in your position and I remember just how terrifying and overwhelming it can be. So I encourage every single one of you, I'm very active on social media. These are my details. I will be delighted to try and help every single one of you in any way, in whatever way that might be. Thank you so much again to the National Health Conference for having me speak. I hope that's been helpful. And if I can try and answer any of your questions, I'll certainly do my very best. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful and informative and very inspiring. Um, so now we can move on to some questions that people have asked in the chat. So one of the questions was, um, is CST necessary in becoming a surgeon? Um, I guess they're also referring to like run through specialties and if you could just elaborate on that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in general, some form of core surgical training is necessary. Uh, to go on to the formal pathway of becoming a registrar. So what I mean by that is core surgical training can be the two specific years that you do. For example, uh, if you want to be a general surgeon, then you can do general surgery, but also try other specialties like pediatric surgery. And then after you complete those two years, you go through a separate application process for ST3 and apply for general surgery. And the idea is that those two core surgical training years prepare you for that. Now, alternatively, if you want to be a neurosurgeon, not every surgical specialty has a run through, but neurosurgery, for example, does, MaxFax does, plastics does. You then apply for plastic surgery. That guarantees that in seven years time, you will become a plastic surgery consultant, but those two years do not necessarily just include plastic surgery. So in a sense, you're still doing core surgical training. Now, an outside to that is, not all uh, trainees, uh, be it national, UK, British trainees, or international trainees, will have gone through this pathway. So there is an informal pathway where you can demonstrate that you have got the competencies of a core surgical trainee and apply to national training that way. It is much more difficult, it is way more onerous, and you have to really go out of your way to prove that you've got these competencies. So the most efficient and formal way of becoming a UK-based uh, registrar trainee and eventually consultant is through the core surgical training pathway. Okay, and for the core surgical training, do you rank the surgical job that you want similar to in foundation or is it mostly random? No, no, you absolutely rank. So you- Oh, you rank, okay. Yeah, absolutely. You rank all of the uh, jobs that you want. And obviously there will be ideally the ones uh, that have the specialties you want. So if you have no interest in general surgery, uh, but you want to do plastics or ENT, then you'll ramp the, rank those higher. And, what, and that is why it's so important, because for example, Wales may not have uh, the particular surgical specialties you want, and they may all be based in London or East of England. Uh, so it's really important to do your research um, to ensure you get what you want out of your training program. Mm -hmm. And for CST, do you apply to a deanery or to a specific hospital? Ah, right. So in the old system, you would apply to a specific hospital, um, which was unfair because if I got on really, really well uh, with the uh, people at St. Mary's and I knew the consultants, they I would see them on the panel and there is a potential conflict of interest. So now everyone goes through a national training program and the national training program includes all of the hospitals and the surgical specialties that are offering training. So it's done through an impartial informal system so you can apply to scotland but you don't need to go to scotland in order to apply for the training programs there it's all done uh, through a national informal system okay um next question was what is the hardest clinical station example you have been given 
Um, so I think that's it's quite limited to answer that in that I can I can tell you about my experience. Um, I don't think I was ever given or have I come across anything clinical that was difficult because it is all run of the mill scenarios that you're likely to see uh, as a core surgical trainee or as an ST3. Uh, so there'll be questions based uh, around an acute abdomen. Uh, there'll be questions based around um, a patient who's hemorrhaging and a patient that requires surgery. Um, so, I, you know, I, and I wouldn't think about it that way. There, there really won't be any questions that are unfair. Um, if you happen to go on interview courses or if you, if you want to invest in my book, uh, there's lots and lots of clinical scenarios and every single one of them you should be thinking if I was the uh, general surgeon on call or on tape uh, th these are very typical examples of scenarios I would get where I suppose where they push you and where things can become more challenging is if you're doing really well and they want to push uh, the boundary of your knowledge so for example if you're querying uh, that your patient has an abdominal aortic aneurysm do you know the classification system for aneurysms uh, do you know the current uh, guidelines that dictate when you would operate on a patient and when you wouldn't operate on a patient? And that's where the scenarios become more challenging. Okay. Um, my question was, um, does the management, I mean, the management station deal with HIPAA or NHS security policies? It certainly could do. Uh, I've not seen any recent um, questions based around that, but that is more than fair game uh, to start speaking about those kind of things they probably do sound a little bit too extraneous um, and they kind of ignore some of, um, I suppose, some of the things that they want to test. So I think you're much more likely to get uh, scenarios like you've got a drunk consultant on your ward. How would you manage that particular scenario? Uh, or tell me about the European Working Time Directive and do you still think it uh, adds to or worsens surgical training in this country? Mm -hmm. um Another question, someone wanted to clarify again what an audit was exactly. You can yeah, go absolutely. that again. Absolutely. So um, uh, an audit is an opportunity for you to see how good clinical practice is. So every single audit will start with a standard or a guideline that for, so for example, one of the audits that I've done and it's quick and easy is a ward round checklist. So the Royal College of Surgeons have published a guideline saying that a, every single ward round for a minimum, sorry, not a ward round, sorry, a, an, an operation note. The Royal College of Surgeons have published a guideline that says, as a minimum, every single operation note should have these 10 things. And they include your name, your uh, the date of the operation, what the name of the operation was, your signature, that kind of thing. So uh, that is your guideline and that is your standard as opposed to a research question, which actually you don't know what the answer to this is. There are no actual guidelines and you're helping to contribute to that knowledge. So you start with your guideline and your standard, and then you ask the question in your hospital, how many operation notes actually have the 10 things that were meant to include as a minimum? So you get to decide uh, what time period or how many operation notes you're going to audit. There obviously needs to be a reasonable time period, like two to three months, where you go back and look at all of the operation notes, either in plastic surgery or in general surgery, or if you're very keen, all of the surgical specialties, which, which is probably unnecessary. And you compare those operation notes to the guideline from the Royal College of Surgeons and see what things are missing, what things are always present, and what percentage of your operation notes actually adhere to the guidelines. So when I did this, I found in my uh, particular hospital, I was in plastic surgery, and only 60% of the operation notes adhered to the standard published by the Royal College of Surgeons. And you go further and don't just say that it's 60%. The things that we were failing to say was, did we insert any implants? Were there any complications um, from the operation that was done? Was anything done differently? Things that your trainees, consultants say, well, that seems obvious, but we don't specifically say it. I then action that by publishing a guideline in every theater and in our office that said every single operation note must have these headings and I created a new operation note. So every operation that we did as a department, we had to use my operation note template that had these 10 things. I then allowed that to take place for three months and then I re-audited and I think we went up to something like 90% or 95%. So what you've done is taken a standard You've seen currently how well are you doing? 
you've then put in an execution plan to say, right, this is how we're going to adjust and make sure we do uh, meet the standard we're trying to get. And then you re-audit to see if it's actually worked. And the point of that audit was there are important details that the Royal College of Surgeons have said you must include on an operation note, and we're not meeting those. So there's a patient safety issue. Um, there are details that um, you will know at the time of surgery, but if you go back to look for whatever reason, they will be missing. And the other thing is that there is a guideline, and we're not aware of that as a specialty and as doctors and surgeons, and we need to be aware of that. And those are my outcomes. And as far as I know, ever since the department has continued to use that template. And that's an example of a closed loop audit that you can go on and present at your local, regional, or even national uh, conferences. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another question here is, in terms of presentations, if your poster was presented at an international conference, but your colleague presented it, would you still get the points given you were the first author of the poster? All right, so uh, yes, you would. Um, however, by definition, uh, if someone is presented on your behalf, uh, your name wouldn't be first on that poster, uh, which is how you're meant to write these things. So even though you've done all the work and it's been presented on your behalf, the fact that you've not actually presented that poster yourself means that you would be second. Now, that is slightly unfair that if you've got, for whatever reason, you've not been able to attend the conference, you can be joint first author, but you need to then be prepared to explain why you've done that. So. If you say that I did all the work uh, for this particular presentation, I created the poster, I did the submission, and it was purely a logistical problem of me not being able to attend, and a colleague of mine then presented it, that is very, very reasonable. Um, as opposed to it was jointly shared, um, and you didn't present it, uh, and you've still put your name first, you would be penalized for that. And the ideal setting is, of course, that you try and present all of your work yourself. Mm -hmm. And there's another question about the ebook, uh, sorry, the e-logbook, yeah. like uh, how to start it, what it is exactly. Yeah, sure. So your e-logbook is your formal record of all of the operations that you've observed, assisted, uh, uh, performed, and this is a demonstration of your commitment to surgery. So, and again, people really miss out on this in that as soon as you qualify and become an FY1 doctor, you can go and observe surgery and record that in your logbook and that counts and is a demonstration of your commitment. So you don't need to scrub, you don't need to put in a single stitch of an operation. If you are standing there, you know the patient and the team is aware that you're there and you're observing, you should record that in your e-logbook. The e-logbook is free for all UK-based uh, trainees. You only need a GMC number to um, uh, sign up for it. Um, and as you get further and further along, as you demonstrate your commitment and enthusiasm for surgery, you will be able to scrub and automatically that puts you down as assisting in an operation. Uh, you will eventually get to the point where actually you can do parts of an operation. And all of that is recorded in your e-log book and validated by the consultant doing the surgery. And then printing that and including that in your portfolio is a part of some of the stations that are marked. So this is only starting from F1. You wouldn't be able to fill this out in medical school, for example? Oh, no, for, no, for sure. You can do it as a medical student as well. And obviously, okay. realistically, you'll be observing and maybe assisting in some operations. But absolutely, you can do it as a medical student. OK. Um, the next question is, what specialty are you in and what made you choose that? Maybe someone who joined later. But. Yeah, for sure. I do oral and maxillofacial surgery. And, and the story that I said at the very beginning, uh, that was actually the reason in that about halfway through med school, I decided I think I wasn't gonna do GP and I wasn't gonna do a medical specialty. I felt like surgery suited me well. I then did three years of every single surgical specialty there is to do and I was always about to give up because I did cardiothoracic and I thought this is great, but it doesn't, you know, I don't think this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life. I did general surgery and I thought, oh, this is great, but I'm not quite sure that this is what I wanna do at 50, 60. And then that seven-year-old girl that I mentioned, I was doing ear, nose and throat surgery at Norfolk Park Hospital and quite by accident went into the maxillofacial surgery clinics. And that's where I met the seven-year-old who was having facial reconstructive surgery done. And I thought to myself, this is some of the most elegant surgery that I've ever seen. Uh, these people who have got dual qualification in, in dentistry and medicine are some of the most humble down-to-earth people that I've ever seen. Um, and this really does feel like it fits in with the lifestyle I want. And 
a lot of you do need to think about that in that you know your on-call burden whether you want to have relationships family you know how does this surgical specialty fit in with all of that so something that you love to do and enjoy when you were 20 and 30 you need to make sure you enjoy as a senior at 50 and 60. so i'm an st4 in oral and maxillofacial surgery i'm dual qualified in medicine and in uh, dentistry and i can say without a shadow of doubt i absolutely love what i get to do and i still consider it a huge privilege um and uh, i still can't believe i get to do what i do and enjoy it so much and, and be paid for it and be paid really well for it so that's what i what i currently get up to and i work in uh adam brooks hospital in cambridge at the moment okay wonderful um another question is uh what would you change with regards to your path um to surgery what would i change if anything sorry what would I... like what would you change about your path into surgery oh about my path into surgery um, yeah i suppose the only thing i have ever considered when i look back on it is perhaps taking an f3 year uh, in that because of my background and i suppose growing up the way i grew up i never took a break so from gcse's to a levels to medical school foundation training core surgical training and now my st uh, training at no point did i ever take uh, a single break and i suppose that's because i loved it so much and i enjoyed it um but i think more and more now uh, people are in being encouraged uh, to take extra time for themselves um, and i suppose there's just it would have just been an opportunity to do other things um i spent six weeks on my surgical elective in cape town uh, doing trauma surgery and it was one of the best experiences i ever had so i think the only thing i would have considered is actually realizing there's absolutely no rush uh, when i was a medical student i wanted to become the youngest consultant ever which is very immature thinking and now i love the fact that i get to enjoy and take my time and uh, actually want to become the best possible surgeon i can be not just the youngest and the fastest and i think that's the only change i would have ever considered making Okay, well, um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, what are some highlights from your career? Oh gosh, highlights. Um, <laughs> uh, going to the White House, um, speaking in the House of Commons and the United Nations were great. I, I need to be really careful when I speak about these things. And in fact, I'm gonna, you know, yeah. I'll, I, I am telling you these things and I, I really hope that they don't come across as arrogant. I'm telling you these things because they're the truth and they are things that I've been lucky to achieve. And the point of telling you them and answering your question is these are the wonderful things that you can all do and that are all fully possible. And in a way, they've got almost nothing to do with surgery in terms of treating patients. So I spoke in the House of Commons about the importance of widening participation within medicine and how important it is uh, to ensure that we're getting the very best candidates and it shouldn't matter what financial background you come from. That was obviously something very close to my heart, given that I grew up homeless for a period of time. Uh, and similarly, the experiences I had in America and going to the White House, you know, my first ever operation where I saw a patient in clinic, uh, I worked their case up uh, and helped to decide what surgery they were going to have, consented them, seeing them on the day of the operation, doing that operation myself and then following them up. You know, there are so many peaks that you get in your career and there's so many other things that you can do and things that you would never, ever have imagined. And, and I, I hope that in no way that comes across as arrogant. What I hope that does is inspire all of you to say that there, this is a really wonderful career to get into. Um, and there are so many incredible things. You know, I've published, I have prizes, you know, I've published books and that's all wonderful. But even more importantly than that, I've, got, I've been able to go and work with some amazing colleagues all around the country. I still learn from all of them, be, be it medical students, uh, be it consultants who have got years and years of experience. Um, and you just think, oh my God, this, do I really get to do this as a career? And you know, get to travel the world and get to learn from amazing people, work with cutting edge technology. So it's, it's all incredible and amazing. And there are so many highs. And I hope that all of you you know, hope that one day I get to call every single one of you a colleague and get to work alongside you, and, and that'll be a great privilege. All right, thank you so, so, so much. That was very, very inspirational. Um, and yeah, we are now finished on time. Um, thank you again so much for joining us. Um, 
and giving that amazing talk. And I'm sure everyone else in the chat, I mean, they have been saying that everyone feels very inspired and are thanking you. So, oh, that's so, so thank you for joining us. So kind. Thank you all so much. Uh, and again, thank you for having me speak. And it's so, so lovely to see enthusiastic uh, trainees. Uh, as I said, my, my contact details uh, on social media are here and I'll be delighted to help anyone uh, if I can. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.